Science 20 and Bio 20 students and teachers. We are here from Nelson Mandela High School, and I'm Shannon Donnelly, Jody Pete, Aaron Badry, Jonathan Ski. So in Northeast Calgary is where Nelson Mandela is, and we are here to film a virtual field study for you and us to experience a real biological field study um, as much as we can. Hi everybody, welcome to Fish Creek Provincial Park. My name is Roland Kersinger, I'm the Formal and Environmental Education Coordinator for East Kananaskis. And I'd like to welcome teachers from Nelson Mandela High School today. We're going to be running through the Ecosystems and Impacts uh, field study for Science and Bio 20 students. Uh, because it's difficult for you to come to the park today, we're trying to bring it to you. So I want to thank Shannon Donnelly and the rest of the teachers for uh, suggesting this and coming out today uh, to shoot this. Hopefully you'll find it interesting, useful, and a great break from regular classroom kind of work. Uh, I, like, I wanna start by recognizing that Alberta Parks is, uh, and Fish Creek Provincial Park is part of the traditional territory of the peoples of Treaty 7 uh, in Southern Alberta. This includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pakani, and Kainai First Nations. Our closest neighbor, the Sutsina Nation, just a few hundred meters to the west of us, uh, and the Stony Nakoda First Nation. Uh, the city of Calgary is also home to Beatty Nation, uh, Alberta Region 3. We're fortunate because Fish Creek is now a provincial park, so we get to come and do all kinds of stuff here. And today we're gonna be exploring scientific field studies and ecology here in the park. All right, so equipment for heading out into the field. We're gonna be sampling our environments in a number of different ways. And biologists, field scientists use a number of different techniques in order to take a large area and cut it down to size. The first sampling technique we're gonna rely on is a transect line. So we'll stretch our transect line through our ecosystem and that gives us a representative slice or sample for us to work on. Of course, we want to record our information, so we'll be utilizing a set of data sheets that basically inform us what information we want to collect. And when we're looking at ecosystems, the information we're collecting is the biotic and the abiotic characteristics that allow us to distinguish between different types of ecosystems and examine the characteristics or the features that make that ecosystem that ecosystem. In order to cut things down to size further, we'll be using a grid square to look more closely at what kinds of plants exist in our ecosystem. And a key to some of those plants, in this case, native trees and shrubs, to allow us to identify what trees and shrubs exist in the ecosystems we're studying. So, abiotic characteristics, temperature, okay? We'll be looking at both air temperature as well as soil temperature, soil moisture, okay? Trying to get a relative sense of how much moisture exists within the soil at below our feet. We wanna take a closer look at that soil, so we'll be pulling a soil sample or a soil plug so that we can look at the different layers of soil, try to get an idea of what's actually in that soil. Okay, the large tape measure will utilize along with our transect line to set up a study site. Again, cutting that larger area into a smaller manageable piece. We'll be doing some chemistry, including soil pH. So we'll be utilizing distilled water and pH test strips along with some of the soil we pull in order to get a sense of what the pH levels are. Of course, too high, too low, that will impact what will grow out of that soil. The biotic, the living stuff, that's the stuff I get excited about. Things like soil probes, magnifying glasses, and containers like this for you to collect insects and show me, because I like insects and spiders. So we'll try to get a look at some of that, those other living things, right? We'll also be doing a bird point count, which doesn't require any equipment. And we'll be looking at mammal signs along our transect as well to give us a more complete view of what the living elements of our ecosystems are. For those of you that like chemistry, 
we'll be delving into a little bit more soil chemistry by looking at two particular growth factors, potassium and phosphorus. These tests are a little more involved. This is everything we need just for those two tests. So we'll be utilizing soil samples, a variety of reagents to get a sense of the phosphorus and the potassium levels that exist in the soils in our ecosystems that we're studying today. All right, so we've laid out our transect here in the Aspen Parkland. We're now going to set up our first sampling site, a quadrat. For that, we'll use the Forester's tape measure. We're going to set up a quadrat that's three meters square, and that should give our participating teachers room to be able to do this data collection that they need to do. So you should be at about nine meters, and if you're not, tell Shannon which direction she has to go to put that on the rope. I need, this is nine meters. So, so you got to step in a little bit. There we go. Okay, so step down all of those corners. Excellent. All right, quadrat set up, everybody's ready to go. We're gonna lay this grid square out so that people can do some plant identification. And then we're gonna get to the soil chemistry. All right, are you ready? I am. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull a soil sample with this corer. I can, I can do that. What you'll need to do is go in the bottom of the kit, grab yourself a pair of fashionable gloves like mine, because we're gonna be using a variety of chemical reagents, so we wanna protect ourselves. I'm simply gonna scrape away some of the dead plants, the detritus, in order to try to get a sample that we can test for some chemical elements. Beautiful. So now you'll find two kits, one with a P for phosphorus, one with a K for potassium. You'll notice we have extraction, phosphorus and potassium. And you're gonna have to do the extraction first and then the other two. Okay. So here's the soil you'll use. What we're going to try to do is get rid of most of the organic material out of it. Roots, bits of wood, twigs. If we found any earthworms, we'd pull them out. Because we want to test the soil, not the organic matter. So, just follow the instructions for extraction. Well, it's the morning, so we'll go with the AM. The little container is distilled water. Okay, so it says to add one heaping teaspoon of soil. Not yet. Start After here. you fill it to the water. Read the instructions, kids, it's important. And then number two. So what do these tablets do that we're adding? So the tablets you're going to add are what's called a flocking agent. 
And once they're dissolved in solution, anything you then add to that solution that has solids in it, the flocking agent is going to cause those solids to amass together and separate out, leaving just the solution. So shake and dissolve those, then add your soil. It'll take a while. No problem. So let's see how everybody else is doing. So we're doing another soil sample to try and get the different layers within the soil uh, that Roland can expand on. Here is So we would literally try and get a soil sample like this and then we would sketch it out on our data sheet to determine the different horizons within the soil. Okay. Did you find anything weird in your soil? Not really. Some roots. So the top of the soil, interestingly enough, has a lot of roots and biotic content, once living stuff. And then as we get deeper, there's less of that. If I can get this thing to move. And then what will we find on the bottom? So, oh man, you really packed it in right now. So quite often we'll look for probably three layers of, of soil at the most. The upper layer has all of that, uh, all of that organic material. That's the humus layer. Okay. Here's something interesting right here. That little thing. And I'd have to grab the magnifying glass from the box. It's either a seed or it's potentially uh, an insect chrysalis of some kind right so that top horizon the 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 humus layer then we'll typically get into a dark brown or black layer that's your top soil and then if we got deep enough we'd get into a spot where it was a real bronzy goldy color and if you were to rub it between your fingers it would feel as fine as flour and that's the b horizon that's around here mostly clay uh, and then if we got even deeper, then we would start to get into uh, parent material, uh, potentially a lot of rock. Being relatively close to the creek, we'd get river cobble and stone. Okay? But for us, usually two, maybe the start of a third layer or a third horizon. Okay? So this top layer, this is where a lot of that growth happens, where we see a lot of roots, okay? decaying organic matter, Okay. All the dead leaves that are on the forest floor now. If you think about the millions and millions of leaves that fall and you come back next year and they're not there. Well, this is what they're turning into. All right, so now we have our soil sample mixed with distilled water and the flocking agent. And you can see what the flocking agent did is it totally separated that mixture of muddy water so that we now have a lovely clear solution to test. So what we're hoping is that the phosphorus, potassium and other elements that we might test for are now dissolved in solution with the distilled water. So. What our, what our chemist is going to do now is she is going to draw a specified amount of that clear liquid into other test tubes, add reagents that will then allow us to see a color metric change to solution 
which will indicate the levels of potassium and the levels of phosphorus that exist within our soil. Okay, so it tells me to add 25 drops of this clear solution. And then we're going to fill the tube to the shoulder with cold water, distilled water, because we don't want to contaminate it with anything that might be coming out of our taps. And then we're going to add one of these phosphorus tabs, let it dissolve, and then wait for five minutes for the color to develop. And then we're going to compare it to um, the standard scale that comes with these packaged tablets to see the concentration of phosphorus in our soil. So we're going to continue with our soil tests and do the potassium test now. So the instructions tell us to transfer the clear solution um, that we got from our soil, which hopefully contains all of our dissolved minerals into our sample tube um, until it is just filled this time. We don't need to add any water for this one. Okay, then we're gonna add a tablet, shake it till it dissolves and wait five minutes for the color to develop. And then we'll be back and show you the results. This clip shows the setup for a soil pH test. We added a sample of the soil from one of the soil cores into a tube of distilled water, taking care to avoid any large pieces of organic matter such as grass or sticks. After mixing and allowing the solution to settle, any ions or other chemicals that impact the pH of the soil should be dissolved in the solution. We then used a strip of pH paper to measure and record the pH of the solution. Yeah, just the piece right above the bud, that's what I always tell them to do. It should be on the acid. Range. It should, yeah, you typically will be right in that six range, which is sort of what we expect here. All right, so our tests are ready to record. Uh, what we have here is first the phosphorus test. And what we're going to do is we're going to hold it up against a white background and we're looking for the degree of blue in color change to the water. So let's see what we've got. So we definitely see a little bit of blue, but not a lot. So it's not even, I would say, not even recording at low. Uh, I would say we're looking at below low or what we'd be considered below low so we know there is some phosphorus in existence in the soil here but with this test very very little which is okay phosphorus we don't need a lot of it in the soil to uh, help with growth in fact if we have too much it can actually end up killing plants that grow if you ever see if you ever have an accident fertilizing your lawn and we get you get burn spots and that's probably because you've over fertilized and one of those elements is phosphorus would the time of year have anything to do with how much phosphorus is in the soil oh good question so because phosphorus will be absorbed by plants i would expect that potentially earlier in the year we might have more uh, and as we go through the growing season okay but as things decompose okay and the organ organisms in the soil use up that material. Depending on what those organisms are and what's being decomposed, that could also increase it. So probably depends on what's in your soil to begin with and what's decomposing in your soil. Great. All right, next, potassium. potassium. So potassium is a strange one because what it does is it turns our sample completely cloudy. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put that cloudy solution against a black background 
and see how intense the black shines through. So what you have to decide, is it low, is it moderate, or is it high against the black? So not so much a color, but the degree of gray to black. I can't really see it. What do we think? Mm. I don't see much coming through, but you guys will have to decide when you look at the pictures. Mm -hmm. So again, another one of those important growth elements for plants. Okay, too little, not a good thing. Too much, not a good thing. Different plants will use different amounts, okay? Now, the important thing, because we're in the field, okay, we have to be conscious that we've added chemical reagents to all of these test materials. So we don't want to just dump it out. So we want to be very responsible about how we do things. So we're going to collect all of our liquid waste in a container to properly dispose of later on. And all of our hard waste, our garbage, the foil from the tablets, etc., they've gone into a garbage can. So now it's time to do the dishes, time to clean up. So here we're beneath a cluster of small spruce trees and we can see something that will have a definite effect on soil chemistry. Spruce trees are evergreen, but that doesn't mean their needles stay on the tree forever. Okay? So they are shed on a regular basis. And these needles, as they decompose, will actually increase the acidity of the soil. Okay. So, if we were to do some soil pH testing right in here, we might find the pH is lower, more acidic, than it is in the area we were earlier in amongst a bunch of aspen trees. There's also some thought that spruce trees give off allopathic chemicals or growth inhibitors, which limit the amount of growth in their immediate vicinity as well a great competitive advantage to allow them to get a foothold and dominate. All right, so here we are in our quadrat and we've got our grid square laid down. So the most populous thing in your quadrat are gonna be plants. And if we wanted you to try to record, draw and identify every single one, you'd, you'd run out of time. So by giving this grid square, it gives you an opportunity to take yet a smaller sample that's manageable and you're able to record. So what we would ask you to do is to sketch and label all of the plants you see represented in our five by five grid. Now, hopefully some of you like mathematics because this is where some of the math comes in. So suppose you start to look at how many of these types of shrubs you have. And if you go through with your identification key, you'll find out this is a sh small shrub, opposite growth, okay? Fine white hairs on the underside of the leaf. That's why it's paler than the top side. This is snowberry. So we have snowberry in this square. We have snowberry in this square. We have snowberry here, 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 here. What we'd do is we'd count up how many of the 25 squares we have snowberry to figure out the percentage of cover of snowberry. Okay, simple math, four times 25 is 100. So you have 25 squares in total. If you have a dozen squares that have snowberry in them, okay, four times 12, 48% of your ground cover is Western snowberry. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to look at and identify all of the trees and shrubs and other plants like the grasses that exist within your grid and you can figure out what percentage of ground cover each of them has. Of course, you tally those all up, you're going to have well over 100% because you have a lot of plants in each individual square of the grid. But it's a way for us to estimate the density of different plants within our ecosystem.
All right, so now another sampling technique is utilizing the transect line itself. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look for signs of animal and insect life along the entire length. So what we would do is we would ask people to walk the entire length of the line and look out approximately one meter on either side. And every time they see a track, some scat, some evidence of feeding, maybe a nest or a burrow, they would record that in relation to the location along the line, okay? And with every student doing it and doing it in multiple ecosystems, we would get an idea, a sense of what kinds of animal activity we have in the various ecosystems we study. I don't think I can go. Maybe there. A little beehive there. Oh, wow. All right, some more evidence of life here in the Aspen Parkland. We found this on the forest floor. Some of you may recognize it. Don't worry, okay? The makers aren't around anymore. It's just the shell of their nest. So this was the nest of some wasps, yellow jackets, okay? This one was probably pretty big, bigger than a volleyball, okay? And all we have are the outer few layers of the nest left. Now it's really cool the way these insects make these nests. The worker wasps go out and chew on woody material, whether it's the bark of trees, dead leaves. You may even see them chewing on fence posts, okay, or the wood of picnic tables. And they chew it up and they mix it with their saliva to create a pulp. And then they'll come back and they'll lay down a strip of that pulp and you can see all of the various pieces that are different colors and different shades. Those are all individual pieces that have been laid down. As the nest gets bigger, okay, they build bigger and bigger shells around it. And you can end up with nests that are quite large. As I said, this one probably bigger than a volleyball when it was whole. So there was a question regarding invasive species and the impact of invasive species on natural landscapes in the park. Here we see an example of one of the species that is somewhat invasive in some areas of the park. It's also evidence of what the park used to be. Okay? So the first users of the park were the First Nations. Early European settlement existed throughout the entire Fish Creek Valley of what is now Fish Creek Provincial Park. And these caraganas, also sometimes called Russian pea vines, were something that were commonly planted across the prairies as hedgerows, windbreaks. And one of the reasons they were planted was they're drought tolerant and they'll grow in almost any soil condition. So they were common in farmyards and ranch, ranch er, homesteads all across the prairies and remnants of them still exist here in the park. Other invasive species have made their way into the park and maybe the most common one is this thorny one, which most people are familiar with. This is Canada thistle. Even though it's called Canada thistle, it's not Canadian, okay? Uh, I believe it's Asian in origin, okay? And it's a common weed in many parts of the park. So wherever we go, that is people, species tend to follow us because we do things like this. We stir up the soil or degrade the natural land cover. And that basically is an opening for these weeds or weedy like plants to come in and get established. So as soon as we create a garden, build a pathway, a road, a parking lot, a picnic area, we are opening up the land and allowing for potential species to come in that normally wouldn't be here. And because of the history of the park, 
as an area for ranching. A variety of ranches existed throughout the valley. And then later on, the development of the park and city infrastructure, there were many opportunities for species that didn't exist here before us to now come in and make a foothold here in the park. All right, so here we are in a bit of a clearing within our aspen forest. Uh, and this is a great place to look at forest succession or how ecosystems age and mature, just like us people, right? When we look off into the distance here, we see stands of mature aspen, that beautiful goldy orange, some big poplars in the background. But down in the understory, a variety of shrubs, silver barrier, wolf willow, and then we start to see all of these small little evergreens. These are young white spruce. Now, white spruce is going to become the dominant feature on this landscape. Okay? Right now, they're small and young. They love to grow up in the shade of other plants. Young white spruce don't like direct sun for the most part. So, their seeds will germinate and start to grow in places just like this, where we have other trees and shrubs that offer them that shade and shelter. But as they mature, right, they start to grow taller and taller. And as we pan across this landscape, we can see a variety of age classes of white spruce until in the distance on the north facing slope of the Fish Creek Valley, we have a mature spruce forest. And this is a timeline of from our aspen through our young spruce variety of ages of spruce to our mature spruce somewhere probably anywhere from 30 to 100 years spruce of course will grow much taller and live much longer than aspens and poplars do and so basically they have time on their side as they grow they will come to dominate they'll shade out the aspens the poplars the other shrubs they'll be using up more of the nutrients within the soil, making it more difficult for those other plants to survive. And they become the dominant. That becomes the climax ecosystem here on the valley walls of Fish Creek. So a great look in a very short span of a few hundred meters of what forest succession can be like. Do we see the same climax communities in all areas of Fish Creek Park? Uh, no, at the, at the east end where, where the valley widens out, uh, we don't see a lot of spruce like this. The valley walls aren't steep enough. They don't, they don't get cool enough and shaded enough. So we go from grasslands to deciduous forest. There's a few spots where we get some real steep banks where we'll get some spruce. But for the most part, it's just grassland and bush like this. After finishing up in the Aspen Parkland, we have now moved locations and are ready to study a grassland ecosystem within Fish Creek Park. The next video clip is a slow moving panoramic shot of our study area. Your job is to listen and look for signs of human impacts in and around the area in which we will be performing our field study.
All right, into our second ecosystem. Here we are in the grasslands, and we're gonna run our transect out so that we can collect another set of data for you to analyze. So you can compare and contrast what characteristics make up an aspen parkland, what characteristics make up a grassland, what characteristics are similar, what are different. That's what the study's about. Go. Here I go. Hold on tight, don't let go. Okay. okay, let it go, come on back. All right, so we have our transect line laid out. We can now go ahead and get our quadrat set up. Remember, collecting all of those biotic and abiotic bits of data, recording them. And we'll do all of our soil chemistry, phosphorus potassium tests again as well. All right, I should be able to take a nap because you all know what you're doing. So there's a, the other green bottle is distilled. Yes, water. I saw that. Okay. get a shot of this. Oh, a mysterious hole in the grassland. <laughs> so this is left by one of our more secretive creatures. This is most likely the work of a 13-line ground squirrel. So in our picnic areas and across the prairies, we see animals we commonly call gophers, which are actually Richardson's ground squirrels, communal, they live in big groups, they're loud, they run all over the place. Their relative, the 13 line ground squirrel, the exact opposite. Solitary lifestyle, very secretive, doesn't like to be seen or heard, very well camouflaged, and even the entrances to its underground tunnels are well hidden. Unlike the Richardson's ground squirrels, they don't make big mounds, they don't cut the grass and vegetation around them. They want them to be hidden. And that's what I believe this is from. So scattered around the grassland, we find the weathered mounds of dirt like this one. Okay, you can see a wasp just crawling on here. So this is the same creature that made that big paper nest, but that's not what created this. This is created by our true gopher, the Northern Pocket Gopher. They're even more secretive than the 13 line ground squirrel. They spend most of their entire life underground. They're what we call subnivian. The evidence we see is from tunnels that they've drilled underground. They have to have some place to put the soil, so they dig up and they empty those tunnels out. So they feed on the roots of plants, like the ones we see growing here. They also eat things like earthworms and beetle larvae, that kind of stuff. And they'll have a maze of tunnels below our feet. Now the creatures may be this big, okay, beady little eyes, big sharp claws for digging on its feet, okay, but they typically are only coming out in the evening and at night to empty their tunnels, otherwise we don't see them at all.
All right, so once again, we're looking at our grid square, this time in the grasslands. And uh, when we look at it, most of you would go, oh, there's nothing but grass. And there is nothing, there is grass in every single grid, but there's, there's a few different types. And there's some other stuff here too. The grass we see here really speaks to uh, human influence on the landscape here in the park. The most dominant grass we find is this one. Okay, it can grow quite tall, it has a wide blade, it'll turn orangey purple in the fall, it'll have big tall tassely seed heads. And this is a grass that was planted throughout most of the prairies. And this is a grass called smooth brome. Uh, and the reason it was planted is ranchers thought that it would be a great forage crop for cattle and horses. And so they started to plant it across the prairies. Now when it's green, it probably is a decent forage crop, but it's only green for a few months a year and then it goes brown. And once it browns off, it has hardly no nutritional value at all. It'd be like you trying to live on popcorn. You might think it's a great idea, but really you wouldn't stay healthy for long. Now, down below, we find another grass. This one has real skinny blades. And if you help with yard work at home and mow the lawn, this is probably what you're mowing. This is Kentucky bluegrass. And more than likely, it's found its way into the park from all of the surrounding yards in the neighborhoods. We do have a few native things growing. The white prairie aster, and there's lots of it out here. Okay, We find Canada thistle once again. Okay. If we were here earlier in the year, we'd find some more flowers. Here's a pretty one just starting to turn. This feathery one is common yarrow. So it will have a lovely umbrella of white flowers. These, of all, these are all done for the year. So again, smooth brome, evidence of the ranching history in the park. Kentucky bluegrass creeping in because of urban development at our boundaries, okay? But still a few native species hanging on. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the effect of slope and aspect or the direction of slope. So of course, something we can use to measure direction your smartphone will do it, but not requiring batteries, the common compass. Why is aspect and slope so important? Well, if you take a look to the hillside, which is the valley wall, you can see all the lovely houses up on top, okay? That whole slope is predominantly just grasses and shrubs. But as we pan across the valley, all the way to the other side, we see a dramatic change. And the other side of the valley is dominated by a mature spruce forest. Now these two areas are only hundreds of meters apart. So why such the huge difference? Well, if we take a look at the compass, we'll see that the compass is facing almost directly north which means that slope covered in grasses and shrubs is facing south. So during the day it bakes in the hot sun. Moisture within the soil evaporates and therefore there isn't as much soil moisture to allow for large plants to grow. As a general rule of thumb, the bigger the plant, the more water it needs to survive. Now, if we pan all the way across to the opposite side of the valley, we'll see that slope is predominantly facing north. So it's actually in its own shade or shadow most of the day. Therefore, it can retain more soil moisture, stays cooler, wetter, and allows for larger growth. In this case, big spruce. Now, it doesn't take much to make a big difference. If we look right adjacent to our transect line, so I want to pan this way, we'll see a tiny slope, which is facing in the same direction as the big spruce forest slope. It's facing predominantly north. 
but it's only a few meters here in the middle of our grassland and that few meters of slope facing to the north is enough for us to see this stand of aspen trees growing. So there's enough moisture maintained to allow for this growth. But as we move out onto the flat, we see the spruce trees get shorter and shorter and shorter until they become just a cat scattering of small sticks. It gets too hot and too dry in order for the trees to grow. That is the impact of aspect and slope, or the potential impact anyway, of aspect and slope on ecosystems. All right, so what we're looking at here is a large mound created by thatching ants or wood ants. Uh, if you can see them well enough, you'll see they're both red and black. They have a red head, a red abdomen, and a black thorax large colony okay so colonial insect like other ants like bees and wasps okay these though are some of my favorite because these ants are crazy aggressive so it might not work as well because today's kind of cool but just gently putting my hand on top of the nest the ants attack so i'm millions of times bigger than they are but their response is there's a threat to the nest attack and they attack on mass and if you look very closely they bite luckily their mandibles aren't big enough to pierce my skin it just feels like a little pinch you may also see ants curling their abdomens underneath their thorax like this guy right here and what they're doing is spraying acid now my hand isn't dissolving, I'm not screaming in pain, so the acid isn't extremely concentrated or problematic for us. But it is an, offense, uh, an effective defense. Imagine you're another insect, a bird, a mouse, a shrew, that wanders onto the nest thinking it's an easy meal, and you get covered by many individuals, all biting and spraying acid. For the most part, that would be an effective defense. So, it's hard to see the acid, so we're going to try to demonstrate it using the same pH test strips we use to look at the pH of our soils. So we'll take, you can just throw them into my hand. So we'll take some of the pH test strips and we'll just drop them on the nest yeah. and I'll aggravate the ants and you can see what's happening to the test strips. They're turning a deep pinkish red, which means a pH of one. Now you're gonna have to trust your teachers on this one, but I'm gonna take these and I'm gonna ask you to take one of those and smell it. <laughs> Salt and vinegar chips. Yeah. Here. <laughs> there you go. So smell that. Woo! Yeah, it is pretty like vinegary. It kind of burns the inside of your nostrils a little bit. And the reason it smells like that is the acid being produced is formic acid. It's where the family of ants gets their name for mycidae or formicidae. It's very similar chemically to acetic acid, which vinegar is a type of. So the acid acts as a defense, but it also acts to help the ants communicate. So I want you to zoom in to the nest. Super quiet though, and I want you to listen. Really, really quiet. Now, can you hear the ants? Of course not. They don't make any noise. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, there's thousands and thousands of individuals here that have to be able to coordinate their activity. So how do they communicate? Well, you're holding the answer in your hand. Okay? The acid doesn't only work as a defense, it's also used for communication. 
The ants will mix chemicals with the acid, pheromones, which send certain signals. So if the ants are out looking for food, they find a source of food, they bring some of it back to the nest, they leave a trail, a scent trail basically, for other ants to follow. Now, when I stop talking, the conversation's over. So how do the ants stop talking? Well, what they do is they simply stop spraying that message out. Now, smell the strips now. All gone. Gone. There's little to no odor left. So the, the acid evaporates very, very quickly. So in order for the message to be maintained, it has to be reinforced with more and more spraying as the ants continue okay, to want that message communicated. Once that information or message is no longer needed, they stop spraying, the acid evaporates, and the message is gone. Kind of like us stopping a conversation.